So Rob, welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having me. You're very welcome. God bless you. So bless firstly, you I guess I'd like to ask you how, how long have you been doing this? How did you come to uh, have an understanding of Islam that led you? Like, how did God lead you to try to expose Islam for what it is? Well, thank you for the opportunity to be here. Like I said, uh, I want to ask God to bless you uh, for your amazing work and uh, for the audience who are, who are listening and watching this video. Uh, as you just said, my name is Rob Christian. I've been a Christian apologist for almost, let's say, almost 15 years. Uh, I've debated many Muslims uh, on Paul Talk. The first time that I heard of Paul Talk uh, was uh, because of our dear brother uh, and father, Zakaria Butrus. He was also oh, on Paul Talk. Yeah, he, he was one of the first to be there, actually. And because of him uh, and listening to him and his videos many, many years ago, I joined that same Paul Talk panel, too. And from that moment on, we started uh, to debate Muslims and uh, preach uh, Christianity uh, to the Muslims. And um, yeah, I learned I learned that many Muslims uh, from the start already, I, I already felt that the Muslims actually don't have any clue about Islam. They don't read the Quran as we do. They only recite it, memorize it, but don't understand what the passages say, especially the non-Arabic speaking Muslims, unfortunately, are nothing but a victim of this man-made cult, the cult that Muhammad created for his own sexual desires and uh, power lust. And uh, by doing so, by doing our work uh, almost on daily basis, uh, we can conclude that uh, Islam is nothing but a political ideology and uh, we need to expose uh, Islam, expose Muhammad and uh, refute those Muslim apologists who are using this for their own uh, personal agenda. Okay, and do you uh, agree somewhat with me? So I debate lots of Muslim apologists mm -hmm. and what I find is they're very reticent to go into the Quran the glorious and noble Quran, the clear and concise word of Allah. And yet whenever I bring it up with even a genuine question rather than a polemic, uh, they tend to want to rush back to the Bible, which for Christians is uh, lovely. It's always nice to talk about God given scripture and God breathed scripture. But I find it strange, I guess. Um, I've read the Quran, not in Arabic, but I don't I don't think there can be that much of a difference. <laughs> To be honest, in the meaning, it, I didn't find it lifts my heart the way the Bible does. So do you find that you have Muslims who are always wanting to go back to the Bible and try and compare badness with badness, if, yeah. you, if you see what I mean? Yes, uh, it, it's funny, you know, because, uh, I mean, when you're going to say as a Muslim that the Bible is corrupted, but the moment we ask you a question, you are going to run to a corrupted uh, Bible and it's funny to call it corrupted also because according to the Quran the neither are the gospel and the Torah uh, corrupted actually uh, Muhammad himself confirmed the Torah and the gospel Muhammad swore on the Torah by saying I believe in thee and the one who sent thee so it's funny when Muslims uh, call their prophet a liar but at the same time they want to have a cake and eat it too by calling our scripture corrupted, yet they love to talk about the Bible. They love to listen to people like Ahmadidad, uh, who were butchering, unfortunately, butchering the text. And that's what they are doing too. Same tactics, same old 35 year old Zekernaik Ahmadidad tactics that they still use. But uh, you know, hypocrisy is huge in, uh, in, us, in Islam, unfortunately. I would say on the Zakir Naik front, I mean, I haven't listened to hours or anything of his stuff, but he reminds me of a Muslim apologist who I know from Speaker's Corner, who, in my humble opinion, is destroying Islam quicker than all of us Christian apologists could even hope to. Like he, he tells us that Muhammad prays, for sure he prays. He tells us that, yeah, yeah, Muhammad for sure took stuff from the infancy gospels, inserted them into the Quran. Like this is not Zakir Naik. This is the other dude. But basically, I find that I find Zaki you know, like potentially due to Christian Prince's intervention. I think of him as a comedy figure more than a serious um, apologist. I don't say that he doesn't have many followers, but when you actually look into his polemic, 
when you look into the things that he asserts, it's uh, very similar to, I think it's just a tone of voice and a presence thing. He could literally be saying anything and people would be clapping and respectful because of who he is rather than any merit to his arguments. Um, yeah, I don't find him to be threatening at all to Christianity, no, unfortunately. For sure, he, yeah. Yeah, he's threatening to other Muslims, though, um, because they listen to him. So, yeah. So on the subject of Mohammed, um, I, I don't know really what to ask, but I guess what are your, um, what are the surah or hadith that you have the most problems as a Christian reconciling to a true idea of God? Like, what do you find most detestable or most um, unholy, unprofit-like, un uh, charitable, uh, dishonest? I, like, I could go on and on, but maybe yeah. what are your, like, top two things that you struggle with? Yeah, uh, you know, when Muslims claim that uh, Islam is an Abrahamic religion, like Christianity, uh, it's funny uh, because I, I always ask Muslims, First of all, uh, is your Allah, is he the same uh, our, uh, same God as Jehovah? Is he father to mankind? They will say, of course not. Allah is father to no one. And the Quran actually confirms that Allah is not father to anyone because else why would he punish you for your sins? So the Quran is crystal clear about that part. So how can you claim to be, uh, to follow an Abrahamic religion while you clearly can see the difference between our holy living God who is father to mankind but in Islam Allah is father to no one so here we have a different God on top of that we see that also Allah is khayrul makareen he's the best of all deceivers but yes. our holy God is too holy it's an insult to associate Allah call him the God of Abraham Isaac and Jacob it's an insult to call our God a deceiver, the best we of actually, deceivers. We actually have a father of lies already in the Bible. His name is Satan, for anybody who hasn't True heard that. of him. True um, so we've, we've got that guy on lockdown, as it were. So we kind of know who we're dealing with when we say the best of yeah. deceivers, a murderer from the first and those yeah. kind of things. And Sister uh, Kay, the, fin the funny thing is, I mean, how can you claim? that Allah and you want to force Allah as a Muslim inside our Holy Bible claim that it's the same God but at the same time uh, you're actually proving to us that according to Exodus 3.15 God clearly says to Moses I am I am the I am right so he's the I am he is Jehovah and that's his name forever and ever he clearly yeah. says that he, pro he makes a promise are you telling me, Muslims who are listening, are you telling me that your God is like a kid in a candy store who wants to change his mind? First, he says clearly, uh, he's not going to change his, his name. His name is Jehovah. And then suddenly we see that his name is Allah and he's not far at all mankind. Uh, Muslims, you really also, need to stop. You need to sorry, stop. Right? You, Rob, he doesn't yeah. uh, disagree now with the marriage of... Uh, for women he's changed his mind about talaq or divorce yes. he's got some pretty nifty surahs going on in terms of uh letting muhammad do things that other people can only do a little of exactly. um and also he's, he's changed his mind about luke 16 for sure where where it we're told that up until now is the law and the prophets and from from now is yeah. the kingdom to yes. beware of false gospels false christs false prophets so he's kind of too late to the party, Allah's, yeah, he's he's definitely displaying some pretty different characteristics to yeah. Jehovah, Yahweh. Yeah, yeah exactly. It's, it's, it's a, a major insult to call Allah the same God of the Holy Bible, the same God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. I mean, uh, our God, when, let's say, King David uh, made that huge sin, he committed that huge sin, God did not say to King David, well done King David, right? Well done, you have done an amazing job. No, he punished him for that awful sin. But we see that Allah all the time is protecting Muhammad. Every time Muhammad commits a sin, like uh, doing incest, right? Stealing the wife of his adopted son Zayd. 
he stole her and he blames Allah for it. It says, Subhan Muqallib al Qulub, glory to the one who turns hard. I mean, God of the Holy Bible would have punished Muhammad for doing so. But we see that Allah is condoning and he says, No, you know, uh, you know, Zayd, uh, Zayd his son, you know, he doesn't want her, go take her. I mean, you know, there's something fishy going on. Muslims what need to think. Happens? I think if I'm correct, what also happens is that so Muhammad will get a, get a revelation mm -hmm. um, concerning women. He's it's now lawful for him to sleep with everybody and their mum, basically. Like yeah, in chapter thirty-three, men. right? The but, ayah in chapter but three. It yeah. gets better because then when he's very tired of these ladies queuing up at his house, maybe they're not so hot. Like maybe <laughs> they're older ladies or something like this. Then he gets the revelation. For them to all leave him alone again yeah. like it's up to him now so god or allah rather in the quran is not that forward thinking like he, he likes muhammad he's got his back yes. but then he doesn't quite see that by giving him this initial revelation yes. he's gonna have to come back and deal with it in a different way exactly exactly and it's strange to me that if, if you go to like a tafsir like al qurtubi for chapter 33 uh the ayah that we just mentioned uh one of the many privileges that Muhammad had is uh, saying that if Muslim, if Muhammad looks at a married Muslim woman on the streets, let's say, and he falls in love with her, her husband, her Muslim husband, must divorce her immediately and hand her over to Muhammad so Muhammad can start to immediately F her, so have to have sexual intercourse with her. I any, what this was, yeah. <laughs> yeah, any any person, any person, you know, all the alarm bells should go off. Right? There, there's something fishy going on. Why yeah. is Muhammad, Muhammad the only also, one? Right? Muhammad also yeah. realizes, or he also reveals, quite uh, contradictory, really. He also says that the greatest sin is divorce. I don't know whether he means for him, like he surely doesn't mean for these poor guys in the street who are just strolling along with their wife, and next thing you know. Like there's a prophet, prophet in love with them. Like he he can't mean for them unless he does, because we know that uh, Muslims, as we're told by Bukhari, Muslims will get to Judgment Day, and their sins, even as mountains of sin, will be removed from them. And luckily for us, they'll be put onto a Jew or a Christian, which to me um, just smacks of injustice. And we know that Yahweh Jehovah is not a god of injustice he is exactly. perfectly just and perfectly merciful exactly you're all called according to his purpose yeah yeah it's it's, it's funny you know when muslims uh since you that uh just mentioned the injustice part uh, when we talk about the original sin, uh, muslims you know tend to mock us about it but when you have uh like uh the, the hadith where muhammad is saying that muslims you know when they are going to uh, be judged by allah Allah will take the sins of the Jews and the Christians and put it on their soldiers, uh, on the shoulders uh, of the Jews and the Christians. But wait, according to the Quran, uh, no one can bear the sin of anyone. So here Muhammad, because this hadith comes from the mouth of Muhammad, he Muhammad contradicted his own Quran, the yellow yeah. pages as we call it, as Arabic speaking Christians call it, the yellow pages of Muhammad. So it's, it's funny that Muslims are mocking uh, the original sin that uh, the sin entered the flesh the moment mankind separated, disconnected from God because of our doing, because of the free will that we had, free we will. chose to go against God. But yes. Muslims don't think about that actually he, Muhammad, is actually stealing a, a, a bit, but changing it and making it sound like, you know, that someone else can bear uh, the sins of the Muslims. Well, so the it's funny. That, sorry, I believe that the surah... I'm pretty sure it's a surah. It says, and for, in English, uh, for no one can carry the burden of another. Mm -hmm. So that's uh, referencing sin and Christ, because it's exactly. a, bit of a, a bit of a cheek, in my opinion. But then in the next sentence, or just after the semicolon, it says, but there will be some who carry the burden of others. So I, I find that to be contradictory anyway. It says, nobody can, nobody has the ability to do so. And yes. then it tells us, but those who do. So for sure, I think it's a, a little dig at Christ. Um, I don't find it too tasteful. But also uh, we see that what you were referring to a moment ago, uh, of Muhammad not quite getting it. And uh, obviously he didn't have the Holy Spirit, even though the Holy Spirit is in the Quran for sure. He yeah. 
Uh, the story of Isa, who, for anybody who's not aware, is the, I want to say counterfeit Christ, but he's like the Jesus of the granny. He has the mother, Mariam, who has the divine or, you know, the immaculate conception, as it were. So mm -hmm. with, with this baby, with this Isa, uh, bin Mariam, in his cradle, he speaks and he's defending his mother, I believe, against some sort of slander. And he says, I am just a prophet. But he's only a, a, a little tiny baby. But we know that in the infancy gospels, not through Jibreel, not from Allah, from texts that were already extant within that region of the world, and were, I'm pretty sure Warwick or somebody had access to them who knew Muhammad, we see that the actual infancy gospel uh, has Christ in the cradle. So it's pretty similar already. But he is there saying, I am surely the son of God. Yeah. So again i don't i'm not going to be charitable and say that's not uh, a misunderstanding by Muhammad. i'm going to say that's outright plagiarism and uh, corruption of the yeah. original sister yeah. k if i can add uh, on top of what you said um uh, uh, plagiarism uh, is uh, very very common uh, for the prophet of islam because if you go to sahih al-bukhari we see that people like uh waraka ibn nufl who was the cousin of uh, Khadija, he used to translate books for Muhammad. He used to translate books like the gospel for Muhammad. So even the gospel was there in the time of Muhammad. Muhammad had access to it. it, it the gospel was in the hands of Waraq ibn Nufus. So it's funny when Muslims say the gospel is corrupted. It doesn't uh, make uh, sense. It doesn't make sense because no Muhammad had access. Corrupting. Yeah, Maybe so when, yeah, so whenever, exactly, whenever a Muslim brings this topic of, the Muslim, the Christians who are listening, learn from this. Say to them, when was the gospel corrupted, and uh, uh, who who corrupted it? Because clearly, in the time of Muhammad, we Muhammad himself had access to the uncorrupted uh, gospel. Because Waraq ibn Uval, as I mentioned, according to Sahih al-Bukhari, was translating the gospel from the Aramaic to the Arabic, so Muhammad can you know plagiarize from it, steal works from it, and. We know that Muhammad was working for Khadija, his boss. She was the richest woman in whole Mecca. Her father yeah. was the richest man. She was automatically the richest woman. So Muhammad, as the employee of Khadija, working for as a merchant, had access to many books. And books like the Infancy Gospel uh, were translated from Aramaic to Arabic for Muhammad. So Muhammad can steal from it. So it's crystal clear proof that Muhammad could write and read and if and yes. if they claim that he cannot write and read which is false by the way but let us not go too off topic Muhammad had access to many apocrypha many many uh, Gnostic writings so he could steal work from here and there to put it in the Quran and Waraq ibn Nufl was helping him Zayd ibn Thabit was helping him so you know Many people we who find, could read. I mean, we find Aramea. poetry of the region. We find uh, other stories that are basically kind of corruptions of uh, scriptural Old Testament stuff. So there's mm -hmm. two points that I was thinking uh, when you were speaking. One is that uh, Muhammad on his deathbed asked for a pen and some parchment or paper. Yes. Um, why would an illiterate man do that? There's no need for it. Like Exactly. There's just no need. The other thing is that the Torah at the time when Muhammad took the cushion and placed it atop of it and said, I believe in thee and the one who sent thee. So actually Yahweh, he's saying, or Jehovah, he's saying he believes in. What, yes. I, so I don't know whether Muslims are now saying it was corrupted between that time and now, but I heard a Muslim apologist saying, well, the story of the non-crucifixion, for anybody who doesn't know the Quran states clearly that uh, the Jews did not, they were boasting, but they did not slay Messiah, nor did they crucify him. So I've now got two points about that, because one, the Jews didn't call him Messiah. So I don't know how exactly. that's all going on. But Just two, um, sorry, yeah, he didn't die. But a Muslim apologist said, well, that shows that the Bible is corrupt, because the Bible says it did happen. But my point would be, but surely Allah deceived them very well, because he's the best of planners and deceivers and plotters. So that proves, then, I don't know why you'd wait 600 to 700 years to come out with this crazy double bluff kind exactly. of Exactly. Yeah, Sister K, uh, good that you mentioned chapter 4, ayah 157. That's the only ayah that is talking about the crucifixion of, uh, of Jesus. 
But the funny thing is, as you just mentioned, it's actually not condemning or attacking the real crucifixion. It's only refuting the Muslim, uh, the Jews, sorry, the, the Israelites by saying you did not kill him. But actually it does not refute the fact that Jesus actually did die on the cross uh, because the Romans had the only authority to crucify people. It was a Roman punishment system. So it's yeah. actually attacking, if you read the, uh, the ayah carefully, it's refuting the Jews who are boasting and saying, we killed the Messiah. Number one, Jews would not dare to say we killed the Messiah because how can you say that while you're still waiting for the Messiah to come for the very first time? So here we have a lie. And as we mentioned, lie number two is it's not... You know, when Muslims say uh, Jesus did not die on the cross and neither did he resurrect, Muslims are actually not reading carefully what the context of the ayah is saying. The ayah is not refuting the historical crucifixion of Jesus on the cross. No, it's only refuting the Jews who are boasting. So it's, it's funny. It, and it's actually at the same time, it shows us that Muslims don't read and understand their own Quranic ayahs. Yeah, it's also, I guess, quite frustrating for me in that the Bible teaches that to be able to discern the, the word of God, who is Christ, and also the Bible is referred to as the word of God, that you must have the uh, basically the scales removed from your, your ears, a circumcision of the heart and of the ears, rather than a physical like a Judeo uh, circumcision. So basically, you need the Holy Spirit to indwell you to as a Christian, you um, are if and when you are a Christian, you will be filled with the spirit and you will uh, discern a different or deeper meaning, a deeper layer of exegesis from the scripture. If you read it, I was discussing this today. If you read it just like a textbook, it would be quite easy to fall into some of the uh, colder sacks of logic that I hear from Muslim apologists. And yet. I've read it both as a Christian and a, an atheist or a not very strong Christian. Maybe I should describe myself as it like years ago. And I, I can 100% guarantee everybody listening that it's a completely different book. It, you, the nuance and the, 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 just the joy of listening to the, the, the voices of people long gone who are now saints in heaven, like, uh, you know, imparting this wisdom and being able to look at it more deeply and that's thanks mainly well not mainly but that's thanks to muslim apologists so thank you very much everybody because i'm forced into looking at these obscure verses like first samuel uh, 15 um you know i'm really discerning god's true purpose and most plainly if anybody watching is uh, looking to debate what happens is, is you find that if you just look at the scripture that you're given to um do apologetics with it will be quite condemning if you don't have the spirit around you kind of thing or if you're not looking deeper. But if you just read two sentences on or two sentences back or maybe a paragraph at the most, you'll find the plain meaning. Because Christ, when he gives parables, he tells us and this is the meaning of the parable. So there's no like hidden code. There's no, um, you know, we're told precept upon precept, line upon line, here a little, there a little. So it will make sense if you earnestly pray for um, that discernment. I've just started ranting, sorry Rob. No, it's, uh, you know, what you're saying is uh, perfectly clear, right? Muslims, uh, when they claim that the Bible is corrupted, either they're calling their prophet a liar or their Allah a deceiver, right? Because Allah clearly over and over is saying in the Quran that he is the one who is going to protect uh, his own words from being altered. Muhammad, as you mentioned earlier, Muhammad himself uh, believed in the Torah and he swore on the Torah. So it's funny, it's funny that uh, Muslims dare to say and call their prophet a liar when they say that the gospel and the Torah is corrupted. I mean, even in chapter 5 of the Quran, we can read that Allah is commanding the Christians to judge by the gospel and what is inside it. But Muslims, because they know they are in trouble. Muhammad created many disasters for them in the Quran. They yeah. have to assume that the gospel and the Torah are corrupted because when they go to the gospel, let's say, they see that the gospel is completely exposing Muhammad. It contradicts Muhammad. For example, uh, the, on uh, about the 
death and resurrection of Jesus, we see clearly that the, the Quran is not agreeing with, <laughs> according to them, of course, yeah. but it's not agreeing uh, many, many things with Christ our gospel. Yeah. Saying he's God. He's That's God right. and whatnot. Yeah. And they, they, on top of that, they can't find the name of Muhammad because uh, Muhammad, let's say in chapter 7, ayah 157, Muhammad is saying that he will be found in the Torah and the gospel. But when they look, they don't see Muhammad anywhere. Yeah. So they have to assume they have to assume without any proof and call their prophet well, and Allah liars. About a false prophet, mm. if that helps, I mean, it's not by name, but it does talk about false prophets and to beware. It, this thing with the comforter, I find that kind of silly because it also says, and he will be with you always. No. And uh, even if I were to take the jihada, um, I'm afraid that Muhammad wouldn't be with me because he sadly passed away like more <laughs> than a thousand years ago. Yeah. So, but the Holy Spirit didn't. The Holy Spirit is in the Quran, as is the Word of God, as is Allah. Yeah. So, um, yeah, that's it's damaging. Yeah. yeah, and it's if it were, and even the verses that they claim, I think it may be Isaiah fifty-three. I'm not sure. Even the ones that are, uh, they try to shoehorn Muhammad in. How do we know that those are not the corrupt verses of which they speak? How do we know that the ones that they clearly, they say clearly show Muhammad? How do we know those aren't the corrupt verses that all of, you know, it's only ever corrupt until they bring a Bible verse to support their claim, as you said earlier. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. And we're still asking, we're still challenging Muslims for the last 15 years that I'm doing this. Show us one ayah from the Quran where it says that the gospel is corrupted. Show us one ayah from the Quran that the Torah is corrupted. As long as you can do it, that means your Quran is agreeing and confirming the gospel and the Torah. So Muslims, they are in the middle of a dilemma. You know, when they look at the Bible, they cannot find the name of Muhammad. They see contradictory teaching. They And they go to the Quran, they see different stories, different things. So they have to, because they know they are in trouble, they have to say without any shame, without any honor, say that the gospel and the Torah are corrupt. While well, the Quran is confirming both scriptures. Yeah. What, um, so for me personally, I guess, apart from I really felt that God was leading me there, um, and I wasn't quite sure why, I guess, but for me, the reason that I'm willing to take uh, small levels of abuse and like be not very popular with, uh, not the Muslim apologists, we get on quite fine actually, but mm -hmm. with, um, you know, people may perceive that I'm being a little bit uh, derogatory towards the Quran or Muhammad. Um, so for me personally, I have a love for Muslims, even though I'm commanded to love them in the Bible, to love everybody, basically, brother and neighbor uh, and enemy alike. Yeah. I, I guess that when I'm accused of uh, Islamophobia by someone who's just recently left Islam, funnily enough, praise <laughs> God for that. Um, yeah. I guess that, yeah, I wouldn't be willing to stand and be shouted at or be insulted for mm. somebody I didn't care about. I I would much rather stand on Judgment Day unashamed and say that I've tried my best to tear down false arguments and to make disciples of all nations as opposed to I just couldn't be bothered. Like, so what's your, um, what's your motivator, I guess, for speaking to as many Muslims of you as you have over the years? Uh, my motivation is, you know, because we have hope for uh, everybody. Uh, we have debated many Muslims who used to come in in our rooms back then in the on Potok uh, panel. They used to come and insult us, debate us uh, all day long. Uh, but we find a couple months later or a couple weeks later, those people left Islam, you know. So actually, the ones who used to fight us, call us names, also these people can change. Their heart can change when they see the truth. So the truth is for everybody who is seeking the truth. There will always people who want to see the, bur the world burning, right? A lot of yeah. people who, who don't care, uh, they're only doing it for evil things. So those kind of people, maybe Islam is, uh, you know, suits them, but f uh, the truth can be for everybody who is seeking the truth. Yeah. Yeah, for sure.
So I so, think it's pretty similar. It's the hope, all, right? It's the hope that we, what we that we are doing it for everybody. Every, every every Muslim can leave Islam, you know, if he thinks he uses his brains. Yeah, please God that happens. So yeah, in Romans mm. we're told that God knows already uh, the names of those who are written in His uh, book of life. So for me as a Christian, I guess, and you yourself, we don't know who's chosen by God. So we have to speak to everybody. Exactly. And for me, especially, I'm not like generally, I don't assume that the apologists I speak to are going to leave Islam. Like I pray that that would happen, but I'm, I think they've been doing it for some years and they're quite uh, comfortable in their defense of Islam. Yeah. But I'm conscious of the people who watch the videos. And I think if I can plant a tiny seed of doubt, then the Holy Spirit can get on with the hard work because we know that we can't talk anyone into Christianity. No. That's it's a, it's a work of God alone. Uh, to mm-hmm. draw you to him and uh, those who are given to the son will come, basically. Exactly. exactly. Yeah. Right. Do you have any questions for me? Because I kind of ran out of questions. Yeah. Well, what What was the reason for you to uh, start uh, this uh, ministry? Because I don't think you're doing it for very long, or especially on YouTube, I think. You, you no. started recently to do it. Uh, you know... It's really, it's really uh, heartwarming that to see more and more Christians doing uh, apologetics, doing uh, what you do. Uh, you know, f- for someone who is uh, very old school like me, or maybe Christian Prince or David Wood. You know, we are doing this for so long, but it's for us when we see that there are many soldiers, warriors like you, lions, uh, who who stand up. To continue our work, so it's you know I'm always interested. What what made you start this? Okay, so I had uh, like I've grown up with uh, Muslim friends. I mm. had I guess when I was a teenager, I had a kind of um, a thought. It was a very vivid thought. Um, I was on holiday. I was very hot, so the sun maybe flayed apart. But when I went into <laughs> my room, the Bible was the only book. So I was trying to like just take my mind off stuff. And I had a uh, a vision in my mind of uh, just countless millions of souls burning um, and condemned for eternity. I can't remember which passage I'd read, mm-hmm. but um, I, 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 to be fair, that, that kind of affected my Christianity. I questioned God. I looked for the verses that said he's all loving um, and just and merciful. And I, I, I didn't like the thought that there would be a Muslim somewhere who hadn't heard of the real Jesus. So for me, Amen. Amen. I have Muslims, countless Muslims tell me, but we love Jesus. We have Jesus. Mm-hmm. He's a prophet. He's going to come. He's going to destroy the piggies and break the cross and stuff like that. So until I, I became aware that this guy is not Jesus, that Allah is not God, yeah. um, then I began to understand the, the prophetic nature of the Bible and, and what's going to happen in, in times of revelation. I don't want, um my friends who i grew up with to be left when the rapture happens to go through the the major tribulation that's going to happen on the earth so i guess that my answer is what physically started me going to speaker's corner is i saw um a friend of mine bob he made a video calling for strong christians and as i heard it like i had a whisper in my ear saying that's not you you're not strong enough you don't know enough about the bible you're you know like basically insecurity yeah. but i prayed and i prayed and then god uses the most unusual people in the most like the strangest of circumstances a friend of mine uh, an yeah. atheist friend from childhood just one day said okay please would you do me a big favor i said yeah sure um yeah. and she said would you please come to speaker's corner with me and i'd be praying about it for so long i was like oh my gosh i yeah. have to go yeah. and when i got yeah. there god yeah. lifted the uh discomfort that i've always felt with cameras and like stuff like that and uh, i just went from there but but my sincere prayer is that like obviously with my muslim friends like in the in real life Mm. it's not a dinner like i don't go to dinner and be just sitting talking about muhammad but if they're interested in the bible i will point out that christ uh says he is god i'll show Mm. them where he claims to be allah um and then we go from there and i just i don't want any muslim to perish i i want them to know at least then 
they know the true Christ and if they reject him, that's absolutely fine. We've, we've all got free will, but then they'll be in, a, they'll have a greater understanding on judgment day, at least as to why they are, you know, them yeah. as they are. Yeah, that's wonderful. Um, you know, the thing is with Muslims, what I learned from my uh, long experience with debating Muslims is that Muslims are a different kind of people, right? Um, they are not open for any other uh, truth or preaching or religion. Why? Because uh, when they grew up, from the moment they grew up, it was already doctrinated, right? They they are like uh, getting uh, feeding in with a with a spoon by the parents. Islam, Muhammad, Islam, Quran, right? Reciting uh, shahada, uh, memorizing the Quran. So. They actually built like a brick wall around them. So to reach to reach them, uh, to to share the gospel uh, with them, you have first to break down that wall completely. And yeah. how how are you going to do it by exposing Muhammad? And Muslims, you know, they always ask us, why are you mocking our prophet? Well, if Muhammad didn't want to be mocked by us, then Muhammad shouldn't have fondled uh, baby girl Aisha, for example, by tying her with his penis between her legs uh, and he should have he shouldn't have slept with her when she was nine years old that's disgusting we call that today pedophilia uh, he shouldn't walk around covered in semen so that his child bride Aisha again had to constantly scrape the semen off of him uh, and we can't continue so on and so on. for another example he shouldn't have asked his followers to suck on each other's fingers for blessings for baraka 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 right because that's what yeah. they believe when they eat the food they have to eat the last part too because you never know where allah hid allah's blessing. playing games hid the blessing the baraka right uh, yeah. and, and and what for me is is most damaging and actually it should be an insult for muslims because how can uh Allah allow Muhammad and his companions to hire prostitutes and sleep with them for a short period of time, i.e. the mut'ah prostitution of Allah in the Quran, for example, chapter 4, ayah 24. How can this be God? How can this be a prophet uh, actually no. allowing this disgusting behavior? This disgusting, and adultery. We're told we, already in the Old Testament, like, no. Exactly, and and as we mentioned earlier uh, when we started, the the many privileges that Muhammad had. Any woman that he lays his eyes on, her husband must immediately divorce and give her to Muhammad. That's disgusting, right? On on top of that, uh, we know the story of uh, Maria Al-Qubtiya, right? When uh, it was the day of one of his wives, if I'm not mistaken, it was Hafsa. Muhammad was in the house of Hafza. He told Hafza to go and get him something. When Hafza came back, he saw, uh, she saw him that he was sleeping in bed with Maria Al-Qubtiya, the Copt slave, right? So oh, yes. instead, instead of Allah saying to him, uh, to him what have you done? Uh, and I'm going to punish you like God, our holy God, uh, punished King David. He actually <laughs> started to protect Muhammad and condone what he did. And on top of that, an ayah was sent down later after Muhammad taking uh, uh, an oath saying, I'm not going to do it anymore. But later we see that Allah comes to the aid of Muhammad, helping him out of, it, of this surprise. disaster. Yeah, surprise. It's me, Allah, saying Allah right in the Quran. If you, if you two women, if, if you two wives of Muhammad, I, Aisha and Hafza, would not stop attacking Muhammad, all the righteous Muslims, all the angels, oh, Jibreel, fire in your heart. Yeah, you. yeah, and Allah, all of them, all the righteous people, all the angels, and Allah will protect Allah from <laughs> you too. I mean, those yeah. are two. They, maybe they are five They're feet tall. Tiny, tall, yeah, women. tiny <laughs> women. Do you need all, all these of the angels? Persons? Everybody. Wow, wow, wow. So you know, we see, you know, we see something fishy going on here. Every time Muhammad is in trouble, every time uh, Muhammad needs protection, Allah comes to his aid. Instead of punishing him for his sins, for his committing adultery with the copt slave, yeah. we see that Allah actually condones it. This is why, people who are listening, this is why we cannot accept Muhammad as a prophet. We actually have to reject him and it shows us that Muhammad can never be in the line of the true prophets. Also, so just within the Bible, like prophets aren't as deified almost as uh, Muhammad. 
we're told that they have sins. We see their sins. We see them discussing sometimes their exactly. sins with God. God may bestow righteousness as he did with Abraham. He mm -hmm. may, um, you know, give them some strife or troubles or a prophecy of better times to come. But yeah. what he doesn't do is run around like somebody's mother, um, you know, m just sweeping up their messes left, right and centre. We're told in the Quran even that Christ is pure. That in Surah 19, 19 here is a pure child. He has a miraculous birth. Muhammad obviously doesn't. He has a miraculous uh, death within the Quran. If he is only a prophet, merely a man, a mortal man, why hasn't he died as far as a lot of Muslims are concerned? Why has he taken straight to heaven without death? Um, in that way, I guess it's an echo of him defeating death within the Bible, which is what we're told. He defeats the wages of sin yes. uh, through one man sin as the world, the first Adam. Through the second Adam, who is Christ, uh, sin is uh, basically the sting is taken out of death. Uh, death defeat uh, death is defeated we are fighting in satan an already defeated foe we are uh, we know that as christians uh, we are united unfortunately uh, christians in the world today have i believe taken their eyes off of our common enemy which is not muslims it is islam in my opinion it is a book that tells me that my jesus didn't die for me if that's true i'm in big trouble because I don't want to be on Judgment Day answering for my own sins. I would like Christ to be my mediator and my judge, as I'm told he will be. And yeah, so as, as Christians, for me, um, I'd like to clear this up anyway. If you're Catholic, if you're Episcopalian, if you're Wesleyan, if you're Methodist, if you're Church of England, if you're Anglican, if you're Eastern Orthodox, if you repent, uh, if you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth that Christ is Lord, he is risen, he was crucified, he rose again on the third day, and uh, you are born again, then uh, who is anybody to judge that? If, if a man loves Christ, I can't fail to love that man because he loves the same Christ that I love. And that Amen. goes for women also, obviously. Amen. So I wish Christians would look to the walls of our kingdom of christendom and see what is outside we're told in the bible that outside are whoremongers and liars and thieves and murderers but each stone in that wall is is the soul of a christian it was passed before us into glory and we must fight we must we are not passive we don't we turn the other cheek in the physical sense we war not against the flesh in very real spiritual terms we must look to the walls and we must see what is attacking our god giving us a false christ and a false prophet and some of the, oh gosh, I'm renting, some of the Western policies that I see towards this denigration of the church. Like it's fine to promote other religions if you want to, but don't put down my Christ, please, because I, we, we must fight. We mustn't lay down and, and just be walked all over. Amen, amen. And you said very important. Indeed, Jesus is risen. Christ is risen. And risen yes. is he indeed. That's the most important uh, part and this is why Muslims love to attack the death and uh, resurrection right. of Jesus because if Jesus actually and I hope that the Christians are listening carefully um, if Jesus did not die on the cross and resurrect then Christianity would be in vain that means Christianity does would not have made any sense it's very important that our holy God loved mankind that he himself came into the flesh to save us who can save us but God because we are not worthy we are too sinful to to save ourselves we cannot save ourselves only a sinful sin, sinless person a divine being could save us and who can do that better than God himself who loved the world including you Muslims Hindus Buddhists all all kind of people every people is loved by God you only need to take and grasp that ultimate gift, which is the grace of God for your belief in Salvation. God that he, amen, amen. So yeah, it's very important to understand what Christianity is all about. Uh, you know, you know, we are not, we, we, we should not be political correct here in the West because that's not what Christianity is all about. A lot of Muslims think that uh, we Christians, uh, you know, are like a bunch of hippies, uh, we sing Kumbaya all day long. No, that's not what Tambourine. Christianity is all about. Uh, I mean, 
<laughs> yeah, exactly. You know, the, the, the first Christians, the, the disciples were warriors. They were not afraid to, to go and, and preach the word and, and actually uh, die for it. They died. Uh, yeah. Most of the disciples, except John, he only he did not die, uh, you know, but only uh, through a natural death. But the rest were all killed or, or butchered or, or maybe stoned to death. They, they loved to die for the belief in Christ that he actually came as the eternal word of God died on the cross and resurrected on the third day. Well, we're told uh, by Christ himself, who is not a liar, who has never been a liar, is never uh, like Muhammad to be forgiven for any sin, past, present or future. Mm. He tells us that the world will hate you, Christians, because they hated me first. He also tells us there is no other way uh, to God but by him. He's not separating himself out of the Godhead by saying that. He's using a collective noun. He's saying God as in Father, Son, and Spirit. And whilst he is on earth, Christ is, we are told in Hebrews, made lesser than the angels. He himself empties himself. He becomes um, physically inferior. Not His divinity remains absolutely 100% God, but his physical nature must be lesser than the angels in order to be crucified. In order to be the spotless lamb that we're promised in the Old Testament to fulfill the sacrificial laws, to to wash us in his blood, which can sound pretty freaky if you're not a Christian, let me tell you. But it's not a walking dead kind of scenario. It's a cleansing, a ritual cleansing, which the Jews practiced with uh, with actual lambs and that we don't need to do as Christians anymore. We have the sacrificial lamb of God. Amen. So. For Muslims, unfortunately, like you can cross your fingers and hope that Allah is going to take off your mountain of sins or you can assume that the jinn is going to come and record your good and bad deeds, um, but not if there's a dog in your house or a bell or a picture. So I don't know how those deeds are going to all go down. Like I'm not really sure about that because I don't actually believe in it. What I do believe, Muslims, is that I'm sincerely asking you to just consider it in the privacy of your own home maybe in your bedroom where there's no, you know, there's a lot of pressure from other Muslims, but if you could sincerely with a penitent heart, look at some of the less controversial Bible verses even, and just see the beauty because the Quran is vouchsafed as a very um, articulate and beautiful book, even though as a non-Arabic speaker, I've been told by my friends who are Arabic speakers that there's some grammatical uh, discrepancies between the pre-Quranic Arabic that was used in today's if you could just look at it and see the beauty in the pages, I'm, you know, I'm very hopeful that if you give a sincere prayer to God to make himself known to you, um, if that's his will, he will do so. And please, God, you can ask me whatever questions you like, and uh, I'd be happy to help you get a better understanding of Christ. Amen. Amen. Now, Sister Kay, I, I, what I also want to say to the Muslims who are listening, uh, please, Please, Muslims, don't put your faith in a prophet who he himself did not know what Allah would do to him. I really ask you to stop believing in a prophet who was squeezed 1400 years ago in a cave somewhere in uh, what do you call nowadays Saudi Arabia, uh, in, in Cave Hira. Uh, I mean, uh, what, is the, what is the proof for Muhammad's prophethood did he give us any prophecies in the quran that are fulfilled no uh, did he uh, do any miracles no he and and actually indeed according to the quran is nothing but a warner so muslims where is the proof what is the proof for muhammad to be a prophet all we can see and find is that he's actually nothing but an antichrist because he is rejecting according to the bible anyone who's rejecting the father and the son he is an antichrist so muhammad the final conclusion is Muhammad is no one else but a fake prophet. He's like Joseph Smith and many other fake prophets who came before Muhammad, after Muhammad and proclaimed prophethood. M Muslims, you need to wake up. You need to wake up and drop Muhammad and his sock puppet Allah and come back home to Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, as our dear sister already mentioned.